Nickel, nickel, nine. You. Yeah. Five, nine, J, let's go. Uh. Yeah. For all my haters out there. Hey, yo, what's good with everybody, man? I hope everybody's having a productive day, feeling blessed, and like I always say, it's one life, one chance. We only got one chance to do this right. Let's get it done. With that being said, just want to let y'all know this is a topic right here. This is an article that I read. It was interesting. I read it a while back. Old news, but still, I found a message behind it. It's going to be a delicate topic, so I hope I don't offend nobody's ears. I hope nobody's that sensitive. It's just an article about a crime. You know me, I like to do my crime stories, and let's talk about it. So, with that being said, hit that subscribe button, hit that like. Always leave a comment. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section. Check the links in the description for the Apple and Spotify music. Go ahead and run my streams up, 59J on Spotify, J Hands on Apple Music, and my Instagram is 59 underscore J-A-Y. Go ahead and tune into my social media, and thank you guys for watching, and thank you guys for tuning in. Now, for my Southern Raza. And everybody that's been watching my channel and everybody that's in tune with the, the gang culture and our raza culture, everybody knows about the city of Azusa, okay? Azusa Gang 3, it's a criminal street gang. Everybody knows it from Boxer. You know, the notorious, you know, what everybody wants to call him, mafia snitch, informant. I don't care. Snitching or not, Sammy the Bull is a snitch. He killed like crazy, so Mexican mafia leader... So boxer obviously you know was a big representation and a bit and a, and a big name and a big leader when it comes to the Asusa gang. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right. So if I'm not pronouncing it right, that's my fault. Sorry, my Caucasian side's kicking in. But the situation that I want to talk about took place in 2014. I'm pretty sure you guys are familiar with it. For those that you are not, we all know the streets of Southern California is governed by the ruling fist, the iron hand, the black hand, the Mexican mafia. A RICO indictment took place on over like 52 defendants. Some indicted on RICO acts, some just took regular state charges. One was a gang leader, the key holder, from Masusa Trece, which was a, like I said, a criminal street gang down, down south. I'm not sure what local area it really is, but he got indicted on a lot of RICO charges, him and his son. We're talking about a Pops who had strong Mexican Mafia ties to the, you know, the obviously the Mexican Mafia leader that was running a Sousa at the time and around that local area, was given direct orders from prison for him to cleanse the city of Africanos, the black community. And in doing so, taking it over through, you know, drug peddling on behalf of the Mexican Mafia, street taxes, hood taxes, so on and so forth. Now, mind you, what kind of, I mean, it's, uh, I get it. We have all joined the lifestyle at some point in our times where, you know, most likely a homie or a family member influenced us to make the decision and, and take the step to join the gang lifestyle. It's always the same narrative. You know, somebody in our family that was connected, that had ties to the street gangs, the political prison gangs, and brought us in. I mean, look at the Geary brothers. Those were like the five Aguirre brothers were all Mexican Mafia members. And then uh, what was the other one? Uh, I, I don't know if I want to say the Ayala. Ayala, Ayala blah, 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 blah. I want to say it's the uh, Aguayo brothers or Ayala brothers. You know, there was, there's, oftentimes you're going to be introduced to the gang culture through family members or family members who had friends as part of the family, friends of the family that are going to introduce you to the gang lifestyle. This and this case right here. He introduced his son to it, brought his son up in the same neighborhood, started working with him while he was working on behalf of the Mexican Mafia. Well, the incident took place around 2008, 2009, but in 2012 and 2014 is when everybody started receiving their sentences. Some of them, like I said, RICO indictments. Some were just state indictments. But we're talking about uh, a policy that was adopted in the 1990s. Where a lot of the Mexican Mafia members decided to say, you know what, these hoods are ours and we don't want nobody else in them but Raza. It happened a few times. I remember watching a documentary on the History Channel on the Gang Dan episodes where, you know, Sudanians were driving around with walkie-talkies talking about it. Any time they see it, Africano, you know, do what they got to do. Which is very wrong. But, obviously, these individuals, you know, spent the most of their lives in prison, are in control of these neighborhoods. And like I said before, prison... It sucks, but there's a lot of racial division that takes place. A lot of politics are governed behind racism. 
Or sometimes you're placed in circumstances where you don't want to develop the concept of racism in your head, but it happens. Prison society is just like that. Prison can, can instill some, type, some form of racism in you whether you like it or not. But the basis of this RICO Act was the father and the son began to terrorize the streets and the communities of Azusa on behalf of the Mexican Mafia. They were trying to drive the black community out of the city. That way they could take it over wholeheartedly on behalf of the Mexican Mafia. Which is a sad scenario to be honest with you. It's taking place in the 90s. There was a lot of bad results. A lot of innocent children were getting killed. I think I read a, I read or I heard a video about an 8 year old little girl who was riding a tricycle in front of her garage when she caught a stray bullet. All this was done to enhance the gang position in which they were already controlling to gain more control over the cities and territories just to operate drug operations on behalf of the black hand, just to start gaining more money. All this was about territory and greed. But, you know, racism obviously motivate these, motivated these individuals to conduct these kind of crimes against another ethnicity group, thinking that it was possible to drive the 3.5% of the population of blacks out of the city. The thing about it is in this RICO Act, there was a lot of civil rights conspiracy charges that were handed out. Five defendants total, the, the, the father and the son and three other individuals were indicted on civil rights violations and hate crimes because of this. The dad, Santiago, Chico, Rios, and the son, along with three other defendants all together, were committing acts of attacks on black American people. Solely on the basis just to get rid of them out of their community so they can take over. I'll provide you with the names. George Salazar, also known as Danger. Joshua, a.k.a. Negro, who was 40 years old. He actually received 30 years. Raul Aguirre, known as Solo, 36, was sentenced to 102 months in prison. Marty Michaels. Marty, really? That's what your parents named you? Marty. Was sentenced up to 30 years behind the civil rights violations and the hate crimes. And Manuel Jimenez was 21 years old when he got sentenced to 78 months in prison. And out of the 51 members that were indicted altogether in the Street Rico Act against Azusa 13, 49 of them got sentenced under narcotics conspiracy charges, narcotics trafficking, trafficking charges, hate crimes, racketeering, all connected to ties to the Mexican Mafia. Obviously, this indictment took place, they said it was like two or three years. But they had a lot of evidence, a, sub a substantial amount of evidence that these individuals were importing heroin from across the border. Obviously, we know where that came from, right? It didn't come from the agriculture business. Obviously, the cartel was supplying them with drugs, big, big, big amounts of uh, heroin. Because, you know, everybody from Southern California that's part of the gang culture loves heroin. Why do they always like heroin? Up north, everybody was all twack bag, all tweaked out, or, or chopping you know what I mean? It's cocaine's America's cup of coffee. But down south, everybody wants to be like, just on a nod, bro. I never tried. I tripped out on that. All this was done to funnel drugs from the border into the Southern California neighborhoods to monopolize the streets and reposition themselves to, be, to, to take over the drug trade. To have an established pipeline across the border in the prison system. All these Mexican mafia members and the one particular that's responsible for this general region... It's just capitalizing off not only these hate, these racial crimes and these hate crimes against the black community, as if the black community was stopping them from getting money. Drugs is drugs. People are going to buy drugs. People are going to use drugs. People want the supply of drugs. There's always going to be a supply for it. And being that in this particular region, according to statistics and articles, the black population was 3.2 or 3.5% of the population. So it was very small as it is. So you mean to tell me you felt threatened by this small portion of an ethnic community that they were going to take millions of dollars from you or hundreds of thousands of dollars from you that you said, you know what, I'm going to be racially biased from here on out. I'm going to commit these hate crimes and try to drive them all out and just have a population of nothing but Mexicanos, dope addicts, drug addicts, Caucasians if they did live there. I've never been to Azusa. I wonder if it's nice though. And just have this whole city belonging to the Trece, belonging to the Sur program, to the Black Hand. You know, they were funneling drugs, obviously, where they were capitalizing off the drug market and everybody was getting rich. But to actually 
quote unquote cleanse your community of the black community just so you can get rich, just so you can take over the drug trade. That's never going to happen. But then you can't forget the fact that a lot of these uh, Sudano street gangs in Asusa on behalf of the Mexican mafia were extorting a lot of businesses, extorting a lot of homeowners, moms and pop stores. Probably extorting their own kind, the paisas, you know, you know, some of them be out there, you know, I mean, selling food, you know, making tacos, food trucks, hey, tamales, whatever the case may be. They're exercising a lot of racketeering, extortion, fear tactics, intimidation, bullying, violence, exerting a lot of levels of violence, especially if they went to the extent of committing hate crimes towards an ethnic community. That was really, I can honestly say, no matter what the circumstances are, was uncalled for. Like, bro, we're not, li we're not living before the 50s, bro, in the 60s. The Civil Rights Movements Act, once that passed and everybody started getting equal rights, bro, like, don't live in the past. This was just a recent case, 2008, 2009, but all that racism stuff that was taking place in the 90s, that should have been a dead issue. Los Angeles is shared by the black and brown community, plus the whites, but mostly the black and brown communities have been the majority of the big communities out there, along with every other ethnicity group that's been out there, but still... It's documented that this particular street gang, Asusa Trece, is the first criminal street gang ever to be federally charged with civil rights violations under the federal law. They were the first ones to do it. Now, I get it. Southern California, you know, the racism does, it, it does differentiate. Coming from where I'm from, blacks and brown communities, we always mingle together. We put in work on the same people. You go to the Bay Area, you're not going to hear no racism between Northerners and Blacks at all, whatsoever. You know, hoods might be, but it's just turf politics at this point. So sometimes, you know, I kind of I kind of can't wrap my head around the fact that, you know, certain people could be racist toward the other ethnicity groups. And aside from the gang culture and the gang differences, we're like, you know what? I want my vato to be number Mexicanos. For what? So we can just apply pressure on our own, so we can extort our own, so we can hurt our own, bury our own, or watch our people die at the hands of our own people. You know, I think multiculturalism and different ethnic groups coming together in the same neighborhoods and learning how to cope with one another, bond with one another, share cultures with one another, set aside differences. Even if you still want to be a part of the gang culture, you can prosper from that in a lot of ways. But... You know, I was active for a very long time. I've been educated on a lot of aspects when it comes to the gang culture, but I never understood how in the back in the day, the Sureños aligned themselves with the Aryan Brotherhood, one of the most racist gangs still in existence today that hate, like they, they, they just superiorate themselves over everybody. Then Northerners obviously aligned themselves with the BGF and the black community. Because Northerners really weren't, there was probably some back in the day that were racist. I ain't going to say that they weren't, but I mean, we didn't care about cultural differences. We didn't have a lot of similarities other than the regions that we came from. But I never understood the racial boundaries and why they still exist. Because like I said, in prison, no matter what, prison in itself will cause you to divide yourself from everybody else and gravitate towards your own kind, whether you like it or not. You're not going to be a white boy in there. Decide not to gangbang and automatically say, you know what, I'm going to go kick it at this table with this black. You know, you guys have no idea how many white crips and white bloods I've seen knocked down on the main line because they were part of a, a black ethnic group. They were part of a black gang from Southern California and Northern California. That racism that just came from these skinheads and these Aryan brotherhoods, these Nazi lowriders that said, you know what, we'll never see a white man join a black gang. That will not exist on our main lines. You guys have no idea how many times I've seen that go down. But I've also seen a lot of Sureños from down south. You know, some of their vadios went at it with black groups. And sometimes, you know, the street beef does partake in some of the racism that exists prior in the years. But still, racism is nothing fun. It's nothing to think about. It's nothing to ponder on. It's nothing to really dwell on anymore now that a lot of it's over. But you still see a lot of it to this day. But then you also see these new stereotypes coming up. But still... Just reading this article and hearing about the stories, there's a lot more to the article, but it was all more or less from the police perspective, so I'm not really going to side with that. I really, I can't understand their perspectives on things, but still, it just must have, it must have, it must have sucked living in that environment knowing that, you know, just for this ethnic community, this black community that most of the time, a majority of them probably weren't even gang members. 
Some probably were. But we're talking about people that want to make a living and, and enjoy the life and just because of their circumstances, they're living in this remote area, this area that they grew up in, this area that they had to na- uh, gravitate towards or navigate to in order to have a standard way of living. Whatever circumstance it is, whatever their welfare was, only to have these street gangs just come up to you, attack you because of your skin color, because of your skin tone, because of your heritage and background, and then try to push you out of a city. So people that have nowhere else to go have to throw their life away, end up in some of the worst circumstances possible because a street gang who received orders from the penal system, from the prison politics, from these mafiosos saying, I don't want any blacks in my neighborhoods. Get them out of here. And then you got 52 defendants like, yeah, okay, George, we'll do it. And really went out there and risked their lives and caught federal civil rights violation charges 30 years in the federal penitentiary, which probably made no difference. I'm pretty sure, you know, the the ethnic group wind up, you know, flourishing and more people gravitated towards that area and the community probably got bigger. So you got like 49 people that got sentenced, five of them received the uh, civil rights violation charges, never going to see the light of day again, and it didn't even make a big difference. But like I said, racism is a, is a sensitive topic. You know, that's an argument and a debate that I really don't get into too often and really like to talk about because, you know, we're, we're, times are very sensitive. If you get what I mean, people are real sensitive. You, you said the one wrong word, bro, it's over with. If you say it the wrong way, it's over with. So I kind of try to stay away from these topics. But this one in particular was just interesting that a father could really mislead his son to not only join a gang, but to work on behalf of these prison politics and then do it on a racial bias standpoint saying that we need to get rid of another ethnic group in order for us to take over these streets. I just think it's a sad and a misfortunate circumstance that a father can put a son through. That's my message. You know, if you're if you're a father, just try to make sure your kids don't end up like you. Even if you made a decision to join the gang culture, whether you remain active and you're just, you know, just aging, you became an OG. You know, you kind of want the best for your sons. You shouldn't be instilling those kind of belief systems in your son that, hey, bro, be racist. You know, be part of this vario, Represent this neighborhood, this cultura. And put in work. And try to become a big homie. Trust me, there's nothing inspirational and influential and promising about that to teach your kids. If you choose to do that, so be it. If your kid grows up and he becomes an adult and is able to think for himself and chooses to do that, as a father, you can give him the best advice possible. But he's still going to do what he does. But to literally raise your kid into the lifestyle, like I think fathers need to do a better job when it comes to raising their kids. That's all I'm saying. So with that being said, like I always say, it's one life, one chance. When they got one chance to do this right, let's get it done. Peace.